In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, O God, Amen. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much, O Lord, for giving us your words that reminds us of your life-giving truths and your promises that we really need to cling on to in order that we may stand. Lord, help us, O Lord, to... Uh, remember and to apply your words not just during this bible study time or when things are easy and go well but oh lord much more so during the difficult times or the times where now we are not sure where you are um so that we can benefit from you we ask that you please hear our study to such as that may know you seen some matters, so please if from the beginning, the mighty power of your love, your cross, please, O oh Lord, make us worthy to pray and fill our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thus is they our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us on into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> All right, everybody. It's good to have you guys here uh, with the Bible study in the Book of Wisdom. As usual, we'll do like just a quick summary to highlight the 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 main highlights, the main points from last week's Bible study, and then we'll start with tonight's. Um, last time we covered from chapter two, from verse ten all the way to the end of chapter two. Uh, some of the main points we covered were, uh, first of all, how. All those who live virtually in Christ will be oppressed in this world because the prince of the world is the ruler of this world right now. Uh, but be of good cheer. It is temporary, relatively speaking. And and as they say, he who laughs, he who laughs last laughs most, especially when he laughs for eternity. Um, so just to, to be expecting that. Um, and then in um, verse 14 in, in chapter 2 it talked about like how the 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 worldly or the carnal look at the righteous or the wicked or look at the believers that's how much they, they, they hate the righteous and the virtuous or they can't stand them it says the very sight of the righteous or the virtuous weighs our spirits down, is grievous to us. The very sight of him is a burden to us. So, bottom line is, don't be shocked when you see carnal people, worldly people, unbelievers, hating you with such passion. But as our Lord promised in Matthew 5 on the Sermon on the Mount, rather rejoice and be glad when they persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Great is your reward in heaven. A um, couple more points. We said that whenever you are dealt with in, in a cruel way, in a harsh way, whenever you're dealt with unfairly or unjustly or in an oppressive way, these are all tests or a proofing of your gentleness and of your endurance and of your humility and meekness and self-control. That was um, from verse 19, chapter 2. And um, then we said that, you know, heads up that, that even if the carnal, the worldly, or the unbelievers hate our guts, we need to shake off the dust, their dust off our sandals. Remember, we talked about what that means to not reciprocate their hatred to you by your hating them back. Yeah, and we, we know better. And then, um, Last point from last week was that um, if we, be the believers, have a hard time to live a godly life, and we have to work very, very diligently not to fall, how much harder would it be for the unbelievers? So again, don't be so shocked or so irate when unbelievers behave like unbelievers. Rather expect it. Don't hate them back, but try to love them and try to figure out how to win them over, how to help save them. 
Um, okay, that was uh, what we covered from, from last week, the main highlights. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments or anything as we start Chapter 3? How they are so strong, Yani, hating the righteous, and they believe their ideas very strong, and they're very convinced with what they are doing that this is the right, although they are wrong. Um, how? I, I think, Yani, you know, like the stuff we're saying, you know, they, they don't have the Holy Spirit, they don't guiding them, enlighten them. Um, a lot of the world's ways they can make logic if the foundation is is wrong um if it's mm -hmm. kind of like what we said in the previous chapter you like you you live yolo you know your life is but a vapor so let's be merry and and let's do this and that to the righteous and get rid of them then it makes sense basically there is no god so what is right from wrong we can do whatever we want whatever is convenient for me whatever's I don't know, makes me enjoy my life better. Just that's how they um they think. Uh and actually we ourselves, the Christians, struggle not to think that way sometimes. Because we're still broken. Yeah, God forbid. And it's uh this all right. Where's my chat window? Sometimes y'all type something instead of uh, speaking this way. I can find you. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now we're in uh, chapter three. Um, and uh, we're going to break it into a couple of halves. So, so let's, we might be able to finish the whole chapter tonight. So if I need someone to read in chapter three from verse one through 12. Just uh, whoever's going to read, please let me know which version you're going to read so I can <laughs> follow. Which, as as for those who are joining us the first time, we're showing three different ones um, because there's sometimes little subtle differences in the wordings or in the verse numbers that you really get a better um, understanding. So we're seeing the Coptic reader actually four because that's English and Arabic. And then um, bottom uh, left here is the Jerusalem Bible. And then on the the right half is the RSV. Um, okay. So, I can... Okay. Thank you, Abigail. From verse 1 through 12. In the name of the and... Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Oh, which one are you reading? I'll read the Coptic reader. Okay. But Go the ahead. souls of the just are in the hand of God, and no torment of death will touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seemed to die, and their departure was considered an affliction. And they're going away from us a banishment, yet they are in peace. And though in the sight of men they suffered torments, their hope is full of immortality. Troubled in few things, in many things they will be well compensated, because God has tested them and found them worthy of himself. Like gold in the furnace, he has proved them, and as a Holocaust victim, he has received them, and in the time of their visitation, they will shine, and they will dash about like sparks among stubble. They will judge the nations, and they will rule over the people, and their Lord will reign forever. Those who trust in him will understand the truth, and those who are faithful in love will rest in him, because grace and peace is for his elect. But the impious will be chastised according to their thoughts. For they have neglected the just and have retreated from the Lord. For whoever abandons wisdom and instruction is unhappy, and their hope is empty, and their labors without fruit, and their works useless. Their wives are foolish, and their sons are wicked. The things that serve them are accursed. Glory be to the Holy Trinity, our God, forever and on to the ease of all age. I mean, thank you. I can make this. Come on. All right. That was a good start. So in chapter two, we saw some amazing messianic prophecies, like from verse 11 all the way to the end of the chapter and how he is the son of God and the one who is truly virtuous 
and we saw how they're mocking the Lord. They're saying, let God come and save him. Uh, and we even saw his forgiving them and asking God to forgive them because they know not what they're doing. Now, let me ask you something. Typically, typically, the blessings of the righteous or the virtuous in the Old Testament were what? What was what was their reward or their blessing or promises in the Old Testament? Uh -huh. Giving them more children, uh -huh. more riches, and long life. Very good. Yes, it was uh, not riches, but a long life and lots of of descendants. There's lots of examples, like honor your father or mother that you may live long. Uh, blessed is one who fears the Lord, walks in his way. Your children will be like young olive shoots round about your table. Lots of them. Um or Abraham and Job, you know, you will get to live long. Uh, your descendants will be like, you know, the seashore. Uh, you'll see your children's grandchildren, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But now, here in wisdom, even though we are still in the latter part of the Old Testament, we begin to see a different level of blessings, more like the blessing of the righteous or the virtuous that we tend to see in the New Testament. From verse 1, But the souls of the virtuous are in the hands of God. No torment shall ever touch them. Remember, why is that this child is starting with, with but, but, you know, because he's negating all the stuff and he's continuing what he said in chapter 2, but he's negating what the the wicked or the godless were talking about their conclusion, the first uh, half of chapter two, you know, like life is a vapor. Let's consume every rose, every perfume. Let's not hold back any delights. Let's um, do whatever to the, to the widow, to the orphan, to the, what. let's just suck the life out of every moment at the expense of anybody or everybody and the the virtue the virtuous because their pre their presence makes us feel guilty it kills our fun so let's let's get rid of them and kill them and then god talks about um that's not going to be the case and that's your your understanding is is completely off so he starts here and says no 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 the souls of the virtuous are in the hands of god no torment shall ever touch them. Okay. Based on this verse, what is in the hands of God? The souls of the virtuous. No torment shall ever touch what? The souls of the virtuous. Okay. What does God not promise to keep in his hands? Or does not promise that torment won't touch? evil people i couldn't hear that no the unrighteousness people or unrighteous people are the... uh, okay Th that's true but like what from what belongs to the virtuous god does not promise that that will be in his hand or that uh, no torment will touch them oh i thought you were asking about whom hmm they will be tortured, Yabuna. He didn't promise. That... Again, again, I'm not asking clearly. So God said something that belongs to the virtuous is in the hand of God and Norman will not touch it. What is that thing? Their souls. The souls of the virtuous. What? The, the virtuous have many, many things. What of the virtuous things the God that God does not promise here? That will uh, will be in his hand body. or will never be tormented. What? Bodies. Their bodies. Okay. Yes. Anything else? Actually, Their everything. Else. Sorry, Mike. What did you say? Their finances, for example. Their home. Everything. Everything else. 
the health of the virtuous, the possessions of the virtuous, the career of the virtuous, right? None of that. It, it's it's accessible by the wicked or by the devil or 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 out of the reach. Okay, the souls of the righteous, their their spirits, their souls. That's what's going to be guarded and protected. That's why. Um, you know, as as uh, as we read that the devil is tied down right now, he cannot touch our souls, our spirits. Only if we walk away from the hand of God and go into the realm of the devil, then he can touch them. Otherwise, he cannot. Just like with Job, he you know his his possessions, his resources, his children, his belongings, his health, his body, his his everything. But he could not touch um, his soul. Verse 2. In the eyes of the unwise, they, meaning the virtuous, and highlight the right verse. In the eyes of the unwise, the virtuous did appear to die. Their going looked like a disaster. Can you think of any examples? The martyrs. Excellent. Any others? We saw what happens to like some prophets of the Old Testament, actually, and the New Testament, like Isaiah, Sodom in half in a tree, Jeremiah. St. John the Baptist. It looks like Kedda, just like what a wasted life. What a waste. Like, quickly and you know. Um quickly gone. St. Stephen, quickly stone, St. James. Just uh, all the martyrs, like you said. So <clears throat> who were all the people who were oppressed and then tortured and then killed, even our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And then he, he continues in, in verse 3. He says, they're leaving us like annihilation, but they are in peace. Uh, Abuna, before you go further in this, I have a question about something you just said. Yeah. So you said that because Satan is tied down, that he has no access to our soul. But even if he's when he's unbounded, he still won't have access to the souls of those who are like in Christ, right? Yes. Thank you for like clarifying he... that. I, I agree. Okay, thanks. Um but when he when he is untied, the actually Yanni, even what he can do to our bodies, our possessions, our health, our everything else other than our souls right now is quite limited. And that's only by God's grace, because if he had free reign, he would know very well to make us quit just like that. When he is untied, it's going to get a lot worse for the believers. It's going to get a lot worse. Um, but yes, you're right. He still won't be able to, to touch our souls. So in the eyes of the unwise, the, the virtuous, they did they appear did appear to die they they're going looked like a disaster they're leaving us looked like annihilation but they are in peace and um actually as we often read in the synexarian that many of them were in peace even while being tortured you remember that and their faces would like sometimes shine bright and 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 radiate um and with all of them, and I, and I love actually the verb choice in verse three. If you if you look at verse two and verse three together, let me scroll down a little bit, scroll up. Okay, can you can you tell? Can you notice? Um, it says, did appear, looked 
like a disaster, looked like a banishment or an annihilation, but they were in peace, right? No, it doesn't say they were in peace. It says they are in peace. It's important. Everything is in the past test except this one. They are in peace. So it shows it shows that even after their annihilation or the death, whatever, they still are like they're still alive. And regardless of what happens, <clears throat> that's the point. Regardless of what happens from this world or the prince of this world, to the virtuous or how horrible it may be, eventually their souls are in the hands of God and they are in peace. Remember verse, verse 1, it says, hey, the souls of the just are in the hand of God. There's the R again. And then um, verse 3, they are in peace. Verse 4 says it very clearly. Sorry, Abuna, can I say something? Mm -hmm. uh, I felt from these verses that uh, once the virtuous person finished his job or finished what God gave him to do, then God doesn't leave him long on, on earth. He will save him from the devil and take him away to heaven, right? Like John the Baptist. He, right. he, is, he, he did his job and then he left first. Um, hmm. we'll reverse, uh, yeah, verse four says it very clearly. If they experienced punishment as men see it, their hope was rich with immortality. I love that. Their hope was rich with immortality. This does not only mean that their hope was uh, that they will live forever in immortality. It does not only mean that, but it's what they hoped in or who they hoped in that was immortal. The only hope that can remain immortal, meaning the only hope that would would not die is the hope in the immortal. The only hope that can remain immortal is the hope in the immortal, regardless of how uh, persistently difficult things are or how unsolvable or hopeless they may seem to be. If your hope is starting to die, if you're starting to lose hope, know that your hope is in something or is in someone mortal could be yourself and what you can do or someone else or in a situation, but not in the immortal God and what he can do. Um, one thing I uh, share with you that, that during the circuits of incense, whenever I pass by the icon of, of St. Mary of Egypt on the, the right side altar curtain, um, I ask her to intercede for us to for God to um uh, always remind us to remember that with God it is never too late. With God it is never impossible. With man things are impossible, but with God all things are possible because of you know what she became after a very very long life of very deep sin and being very far away from God, there's there's always hope. If my eyes are on God, if my hope is, is on Him and in Him and what He can do, that's how one does not lose hope. They, they place their hope in the right place. Verse 5 says what? Slight I have a question. Yes, yes, go ahead. Um, I don't know if you can agree with me or not, but 
entity of the tribulation was someone um like he lost someone in his life or he's really in in, in a deep sorrow mm. how we can convince those people about that hope we we're talking about that we follow immortality um because it's really difficult at that time yeah uh, I think if if they're not a believer, it's going to be very, very difficult to do that. Actually, maybe impossible to to do that. Um, and actually, if they are a believer, now I guess I want to say that if a person is a true believer, they can still be tormented and suffering and in pain, but still have this underlying deep joy or rest or peace uh, in God because they know that the story is not over yet. If I'm in torment and pain right now, sooner or later it's going to be over and I will be in God's hand and I will be in peace. Um, or if um, I lost a loved one very unexpectedly, as a believer, while it's still ridiculously painful, uh, unimaginably painful i i'm living in that hope of being reunited with them again if i also walk with god um because there no there is no death for god's servants but a departure like i you know um i tell people when we look at the um uh when was it on on tuesday morning was the uh commemoration of uh Fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then all the gospel readings had to do with Abraham and so on. And 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 in Luke 16 was the Matins gospel about the story of the rich man and Lazarus, because near the end of it, it talks about the rich man communicating with Father Abraham and A recognizing him right away. And he said, Father Abraham, and he starts interceding for his brothers, even though he's in Hades. Um so I, I I love 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 the the story. It's not a parable; it's an actual story in Luke sixteen nineteen until the end of the rich man and Lazarus. It, it gives me, uh, Yanni, a lot of comfort and hope that our departed loved ones, um, a they are in the company of of the saints and the beloved ancestors, and they can everybody recognizes everybody, and. Uh, B, they 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 see us. They are aware of us. We can't see them because we're in the limited body here on this side of things. Um, and they are interceding for us and praying for us. Even if like this rich man was in Hades and he was still seeing and hearing and praying their brothers. And that's the, the third thing is that our loved ones, you know, we can we have access to them 24-7. We can talk to them anytime. And they see us and hear us. Um, that's, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there's, if a person is experiencing pain, sadness, and all that stuff, this does not mean that they're not a believer. I think it would be a very uh, unfair thing to, to tell you know, uh, a believer who lost somebody not to cry, and and, and somebody who's experiencing pain and torment not not to say "ouch." It's, that's not fair. Um, where were we? Verse five it says, "Slight was their affliction." Great will their blessings be. God has put them to the test and proved them worthy to be with him. And the RSV, oops, never mind. Um, okay, I'm not going to do that. Uh, it says that having been afflicted or disciplined a little, they will be rewarded with great good. Great good. And what is this great reward or great good? 
heaven mm -hmm. to be with him yani it's at the end of in the in the jerusalem one um let's improve them worthy to be with him to be with god in heaven that's that's the reward that's that's the goal that's that should be our our goal here while we're here in the body on earth to be with him 24/7 if we can and so that we can end up being with him that's our goal in in after death too think of think of any suffering that you are suffering or any suffering that you may go through that you did not bring upon yourself and then comfort yourself by remembering this this verse here having been afflicted or disciplined a little bit you will be rewarded with a great good which is to be with him i hope this will will help us all you know hang in there and that's really this here is actually another um passage that saint paul quoted in romans 8 remember we, we talked about how there's a lot of quotes in the New Testament from uh, uh, the Book of Wisdom. This is in Romans 8:18. 8, it says, St. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And similarly, in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, in verses, uh, mainly verse 17, but 16 and 17, it says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. That's that immortal hope. Remember that? We do not lose heart. But though our outer person is decaying, is perishing, yet our inner person is being renewed day by day. He comes, verse 17, it says, For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Did you catch the 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 three contrasts or the three comparisons in 2 Corinthians 4 17? I'm gonna read it to you again. For our momentary life, momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Three comparisons here to keep in mind. Momentary, compare that with eternal. Light the affliction, compare that with the heavy, the weight of glory. And affliction, compare that with glory. St. Corinthians 4, 17. And very similar comparisons here in Wisdom 3, verse 5. It's, it goes from, from slight, compare that with great. Slight affliction, great blessing. Uh, and then compare that. We went from affliction, compare that, or it's going to be rewarded with blessings. And then the last one is put the test on earth, compare that with worthy to be with God for eternity. Very similar. Okay. Why did God test them or proof them? It's in verse 6. That was, was my question. Huh? That was my question. I was going to ask that question. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, God knew you were going to ask it, so. <laughs> That's the need of it. Uh, verse 6. He has tested them like gold in a furnace and accepted them as a holocaust. Why? Because it's the same reason, why would you find gold and then put it in a fire? Same reason. To remove the blemish from exactly. it? Exactly. The more they get Purify tested, the I'm sorry? To purify it. Yes, exactly. The more they get tested and proofed in the fire, the more... Uh, impurities and imperfections get burnt off. Um, Y'all know this, like when a goldsmith wants to make the most pure 
top quality, top notch gold or silver, what does he do? He keeps burning it in the fire over and over and over, proofing them in the fire over and over. And when does he stop burning or proofing them in the fire, the gold or the silver? How does he decide that they have been proofed enough? It can be completely pure. Iowa? No, I'm talking about actual gold or actual silver. Huh? I, I heard trying. that. See. My own. When he sees his face in it. Yes, exactly. The goldsmith stops. He knows, halas, it's perfectly pure. Like a mirror. When he sees his own reflection on them. When he looks at them. So... <clears throat> Um, that's why. Because he wants to make them more and more like him. Is it fun to be thrown in the fire? No. Does it hurt? Yes. Does one become undone? Yeah, we melt. But that's the only way to burn the impurities. Like Psalm 12, 6, uh, 12, 6 it says, the words of the Lord are pure words. How pure? The pure, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, filtered seven times. Meaning, put it in the fire, take it out, a uh, little more. Put it in the fire, take it out, let it cool down, let it rest, uh, some more. Put it in the fire, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, question. Question for you guys. If burning, if painful burning was the only way to purify you and to prove you and to burn off the impurities in you in order to make you more and more Christ-like, would you be willing to patiently endure it? Would you be able to be, I dare say, joyful while you are in pain? Don't answer that question. That's that's a question for you to, to answer for yourself. Is it worth it for you? Are you are you willing to be burnt over and over and over if it meant you become more Christ-like? Hard question. We'll talk about this later, but but one thing that will help us endure it is our trust in God. I can say, like, God, this hurts very, very, very much. But I'm in your hand, so burn away. Um, and if you recall, speaking of Holocaust, because it said, it said it's, uh, what, uh, like gold in the furnace and accepted them as a Holocaust. Um, in this verse 6, here it says, uh, furnace... As the whole called victim, it's a burnt offering. That's the one I was looking for. See, that's why it's good to, to see the different translations. And in Arabic, it's actually clear also. It says muhraqa, which means burnt offerings. Now, if you recall, does anybody recall the requirement of uh, the Holocaust or the burnt offering in the Old Testament? What did the condition should be blameless? Blameless? Uh, yeah. Without yeah. blemish? Yes, that's that's exactly. I think that's and... what uh, Mama wanted to say, Mishkada. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, Henny, go ahead. Um, um, also, it had a, um, it has to be one year old. Uh, there are certain, um, uh, specifications yes. uh, that, that that it has to be it should be in perfect condition and not only perfect condition but also age and and um, um, with the idea of not um, sacrificing to God except the best 
Exactly. But you hit it on the head from the first answer that it's without blemish, other than the other stuff, that it's without blemish. And in order to test the burnt offering before they offered it, they would examine it all over from the outside. And then even after killing it and yani, removing the skin, and they would cut it up in pieces and examine it from the inside as well, believe it or not. And then they would burn it whole, completely, as a sweet aroma to the Lord. So likewise... When the believer accepts the purging or proofing in the furnace of God, because they trust God, this too will be like a sweet aroma that pleases God, because the, the blemishes are being burnt off. So it would be a most wonderful, whole, burnt offering to God. As it says in... Uh, Sirach, chapter 2, verses 4 to 6, it says, Accept whatever is brought upon you, and in changes that humble you, be patient. For gold is tested in the fire, and acceptable men in the furnace of humiliation. How? How do we do this? Verse 6, Sirach, 2, verse 6, Trust in him, and he will help you, and make your way straight. And hope in him. There it is again. Immortal hope because you hope in the immortal. <clears throat> um, verse 7. It says, When the time comes for his visitation, they will shine out. <clears throat> and they will run like sparks through the stubble. How do sparks run through stubble? Stubble is like a mixture of like manure and straws. It's it's uh, kind of like a building blocks, or that's how they, they used for fuel. Sparks, like they burn through it very quickly. And I know they move from and they move from one place to another place very quickly, very swiftly. And uh this will be the glory and the speed and the efficiency of those who let God test them and purify them in his furnace patiently over and over. I'm feeling burdened as I even tell you all this because it's um, it's a lot easier said than done. And I'm you know, intimately familiar with um, many of you who are going through the furnace right now. Um, and they look around them and they see there are others who are in the cooling period. <laughs> they've they've gone through the furnace before or they're about to go into the furnace later. But And then they go like, what I do? What's, you know, why me? It's very hard. But again, the only way that we can stand firm in this is to just keep our eyes on him and that he knows what he's doing and to trust in him, even if it hurts miserably and makes no sense. We also go through the furnace, Abuna, so that when we do come out of it, it's like St. Paul was saying, like, you know, it builds character and we can also encourage those who hmm. are in the midst of it and we can empathize with them as well. Absolutely. I think the, 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 the best person who will be able to help you while you're in the furnace, a, a certain kind of furnace, is one who has gone through a similar kind of furnace before. And they are at the very least able to tell you, listen, I went through something very similar. I hated it. I hated my life. I even hated God. I was so mad at him. Um, but after so many years, after so many, whatever, uh, eventually now that I look back while I hated it so much and I hope to not go through it again, I actually thank God for it, um, for as miserable as I was.
continuing to talk about a the righteous. Remember, the souls of the righteous are in the hands of God. Now we're in verse 8. It says, They shall judge nations, rule over people, and the Lord will be their king forever. Okay. We talked about this one uh, uh, in, in one of the previous books. I don't remember if it was Acts or Isaiah or maybe Matthew. I don't, I don't remember. Now, only God will be the judge, right? So how will these righteous or virtuous people be able to judge the nations? By their deeds. Uh, get a little more specific. Their life. Are you a, a little more specific? Faith. Their faith. <laughs> a little more specific. <laughs> <laughs> someone else remember what we've been talking right now about for for a few verses their hope by their their furnace so by their patience yes by their patience endurance yeah. by their patience endurance to the end out of their trust in god driven out of their trust in god meaning by how they lived their life, like you said, and how they remained faithful. And so when someone on Judgment Day, when someone stands before God and they claim, I, I did these sins or like I did not endure or, or I stopped being faithful because of the hardship, because of the difficulties, because life was brutal, because of the pain of the fire of the furnace. It was just too unbearable. Then the Lord will use the righteous ones as an example, as an exhibit A, will use their endurance and will ask these people, look at your brother. They were able to endure. They didn't quit. They remained faithful. Um, so, and then the, you know, those individuals will be speechless. They will, they will have no answers to give. Excuse me. So, so the 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 righteous or those who endure the furnace of refinement from God will judge the nations by their history, by how they endured. But also God Abuna, uh, He will give everybody uh, fire according to their endurance, right? According to their tolerance. You will not give them above. Correct. We also have that uh, promise from God that he will not allow anybody to be tested beyond what they can handle. Yes. And we'll give them an out. And I'm sure right now some people who are with us or who will be watching the video of the Bible study later on we're gonna, will go and say, no, no, no. This is beyond what I can handle. This is just too too hard. Um, what's amazing is that um, some people, when they think like, you know, something is is too hard, and then they hear about the fire of someone else, they go, "Oh, never mind, I'm good." I was um, uh, just talking with a, a dear friend just a couple of days ago where there's this uh, this very young family with a little child and uh, the wife, uh, they lost the wife in a car accident, the mom of a little little child. Now there's the, the husband's left as a widower and uh, he lost his you know best friend and now he's got the child by himself and the child has been orphaned from his mother and it's then when you look at this and you go hmm and I was upset because I was experiencing this or that no 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 uh, my fairness is uh, just good enough <laughs> thank you um, verse 9 it's very cool it says a they who trust in him will understand the truth. Can you can you explain for me this declaration or this law? 
those who trust in God will understand the truth. If you look at it actually from the opposite way, I think you'll understand it better. So we can say like, those who do not trust in God, what will they do when they are being refined in the furnace of God? How will they interpret things? They will rely on their own understanding. They will rely on the world's explanations or proclamations. They, they will project human attributes on God. So naturally, they will miss the truth. They will not get it. You got what I'm saying here? Those who trust in God will get it. Those who trust in God will understand the truth. Are we are we talking about the moment of the tribulation here? Yes, that's how I took it. Also, moment. you can look at it. Um, yeah. You you can also look at it as uh, a promise to help them endure the fire. Meaning, the day will come when they look back and go, oh, okay, okay, thank you. And they look back and they understand the truth. Hmm? That's, what I, that's, what I, well, that's what I was thinking about it. That's what I understood. Like, they can understand the truth, but later, I, like, I don't think they can understand it in depth at the same time. Because... The verse says that you will not understand now, but you understand. You will understand it later. Oh, well, okay. We can say kind of like Saint Paul said. First, now we see dimly in a mirror, but then we will see him face to face. So those who trust in him will have, I'll say, a certain level of understanding of the truth, even while they're going through the fire. And also, they will completely have a very clear understanding of the truth after judgment day when they look back and kind of know why God did what he did or why he allowed what he allowed and etc it's a good point thank you Mina um I think for in this verse um like those who trust in him it is about um when you believe in God and when you are living with God day to day, uh, you are uh, in a certain mentality. You are living by the mentality that uh, your life has purpose. Um, uh, you understand God correctly. So uh, when bad things happen to you, which will eventually happen, uh, you can endure them. You yes. can like see uh, how they are these things that are happening to you, how they are interacting with you, and how they are reshaping you into a better man or a better woman. Yes, um, absolutely. So uh, the verse actually is, uh, is uh, so pretty. Like hmm. um, when you trust in God, when you trust in him, you will understand the truth. And actually, this is what Jesus has said. Like he said, I am the truth. The truth. Uh, yeah, I am the life. Truth and life. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and as uh, and when he says like uh, those who are faithful in love will rest in him, um, because grace and peace is for his elect. It is like if you want grace and peace, uh, you have to be faithful in his love. Like mm. um, if you want, <laughs> if you want. Yes. Yes. Very much so. And so so those who do not trust in God while they're going through the fire, they're, they're going to miss the truth. They're going to think, God is mad at me. Uh, God is ignoring me. Uh, God hates my guts. Um, there is no God. Uh, like, none of those is, is truth. Um, so those who do not trust in him, those who don't know him enough to trust him, they can easily miss the truth. Uh, they won't get it. But It helps me uh, mm -hmm. to capitalize both him and truth. I feel like that's what, I mean, that's what it should be, I think, right? 
I mean, I mean yeah, at he least capitalize him, but even truth as in Christ himself, you know, he is the truth. Yes. Uh, There's something you'll notice that um, in the, in the Dudu Canonicals, for some reason, like uh, him is not capitalized because mm -hmm. you can tell that this was something that was done in the, in the Vulgates or in the New King James or the NIVs or Protestant, whatever, um, to help the people like better understand when they see the capital H, like you don't get that privilege in Arabic. There is no capital uh, letter, capital, you know, uppercase or lowercase letters in Arabic. Mm -hmm. Um, but thank God, like, we, we do this comfortably known because we have all the interpretations and stuff from many centuries. Um, but definitely, those who trust in him as in, in God, and yeah, for sure, will understand the truth. Who is the truth or what is truth? Like uh, Pilate uh, um, uh, asked the Lord. Now, those who do trust the Lord, they will rely on what or they will accept what they will rely on his explanation of what's going on and they will accept it god's explanation and they will accept it and therefore they who trust in him will understand the truth those who are faithful in love uh i'm sorry those who are faithful will live with him in love for grace and mercy await those he has chosen. In case you're confused because all the many virgins here, I'm, I'm reading uh, from the Jerusalem Bible. They who trust in him will understand the truth. Those who are faithful will live with him in love. For grace and mercy, mercy await those he has chosen. Please note that those who trust in the Lord will understand the truth and will accept it and will live with him in love even while being refined in the fire of his furnace. And grace and mercy will await them. Um as our Lord Jesus Christ said in John 12, 26, he said, if anyone serves me, if anyone is faithful to me, okay, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, my father will honor me. And if anyone serves me, how? If anyone serves me faithfully, trustingly, wholeheartedly, because they believe me and trust me, then they will end up where I am. Which reference you gonna please? John 12, 26. Now y'all, y'all um y'all remember the verse that says mercy and grace uh have met together? Yeah. Mercy and truth have, have met together or have kissed. Heaven and earth. Sir. Yes. So what what is um, what is it talking about? Where it says um, heaven and earth met that. together, grace and truth have kissed or have greeted each other. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Max. No, I was just saying I didn't get that. In 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 the Psalms, it says that uh, you know uh, mercy and truth have uh, greeted each oh, other oh, or I have kissed. I got it now. So what is what moment or what is that uh, referring to? What is it talking about? It's talking about the incarnation of the Lord, and specifically about the moment of his crucifixion, yes, which occurred mid-air between heaven and earth. It had to be, can, could not be just on earth, could not be in heaven, it had to be in between, also because the enemy is the, the ruler of the power of the earth. 
But anyway, that's where like justice and mercy met together. That's where they greeted each other. That's where they were both satisfied. Justice and truth were satisfied and mercy and grace were satisfied. Well, now the self-same mercy and grace will be awaiting them in heaven. Because now truth or justice has been accomplished, right? It is finished. Alas, done. But now the, the, the remaining part, mercy and grace, are awaiting them uh, in heaven. Those waiting in there. The greatest thing possible ever that a believer could ever hope for is to receive the mercy of God and the grace of God. Best thing we could ever hope for. Okay. Look at this part here also in, in verse in verse 9 at the end. It said, mercy and grace await those he has chosen. Uh-oh. Does this mean that there are some that God has not chosen? I believe we are all chosen, but it depends upon on whom was gonna accept. Okay. And interact. Okay. So where it says those whom he has chosen, it is those who choose him back out of free will. Where else the, where else in the Bible do we read about those who were chosen? Or does anybody recall the verse? Not like where it is. It's actually something our Lord Jesus Christ said. Uh, when he mentioned about you are my friends, they're very close. When he was talking about the signs of the end of the world. Aywa, what did he say? Uh believe we was talking about like there is false prophets from Christ they're gonna raise up and no uh, but the actual speaking of chosen is this in John Abona? No it's it's in Matthew twenty two fourteen where, where our Lord said many are called but few are chosen. Oh it actually it's so so I, I just want to make sure nobody uses this to confuse you, that you don't get confused by this, but that grace and mercy await those he has chosen. It can come across like predestination or that he chose some but did not choose some. And No, 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 no. Many are chosen. Actually, all are chosen. All are called. It says many are called, but few are chosen. All are called. And all will get to be present in front of the master, but few are chosen to stay. Few are chosen to remain in the presence of the so master. So accepted him, and Abuna, what, right? What? Those who accepted him. He right. chose. Right. So all are called, but if but a few are chosen to stay, to remain. By the way, our Lord Jesus Christ said that very clearly in the parable of the wedding banquet, where the master found one who entered, but did not have the wedding garment. Only those who have the wedding garment will be chosen to remain, to stay. Those who were able to have the wedding garment and to keep it washed, to keep it unstained. How? Through sacrament of repentance or compassion. Meaning... Those who will remain faithful, those who will keep on their wedding garment that they received when they died with him in baptism, they will not, they, they did not take it off while they were being refined in his furnace. They kept it on and they remained faithful. Those are the ones who will be chosen to stay in the banquet to be honored guests. So, at the beginning of this chapter 3, 
he started to clarify the truth about the righteous and the virtuous and their state and what will happen to them. Now, he will clarify the truth about the ungodly or the impious, um, the sinful and their state and what will happen to them. Uh, that's in verse 10. Any questions or anything? Or keep going? All right, verse 10. It says, but the godless. It's funny how um, verse 1 started with uh, but. <laughs> like, but the souls of the virtuous are in the hands of God. No torment shall ever touch them. And then verse 10, it says, but the godless. So there's the, like the contrast when you say X, but Y. So that means Y is different or opposite from X. But the godless will be duly punished for their reasoning. The Arabic translation here is actually um, uh, a little better or clearer because it does not only talk about those who are ungodly, but those who are hypocrites, double-minded. It says al-munafiqun, uh, which really means hypocrites. Um Meaning those who appear on the outside to be believers or to be righteous or to be noble or to be good people, but not on the inside. Or those who decided not to endure the refining firm furnaces fire. And notice that they are duly punished for their what? For their actions? For their words? No. They are duly punished for their reasoning, for their thoughts. Remember, we talked a ton about that in the last chapter, about the importance of monitoring our thoughts, first and foremost. The deep matters of the heart, that's what God cares about, and he made it so clear in almost all the books of the Bible. For their reasoning and their, their thoughts. But the godless will be duly punished for their reasoning, a, for neglecting the virtuous man and deserting the Lord. I find the order of the words here to be fascinating. Did you notice that in verse 10? For neglecting the just and or the virtuous man and deserting the Lord. So God puts yes. his children first before the four of them. Mm. Honestly, yeah, I'm with you. I would have expected that it, I would have expected it to say for their deserting the Lord, like to come first before neglecting the virtues. But actually, he's talking here about one action, not two. Is one action that he is describing in two ways. Can you say it now? What is God saying here? He's saying that neglecting or disregarding the virtues and the just is an act of deserting the Lord. You see what I'm saying? Like, this is one thing that, that again, let's go back to Matthew 25, verse 31, judgment day. He puts the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And so, you know, when he said, you know, I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink, etc., etc. When you did it to these, you did it to me. So that when I disregard or neglect the virtues and the just, and, you know, when I neglect their need, when I neglect what they want, whatever, this is an act of deserting the Lord. Get it? Uh, so it's not an order thing. It's actually saying it's it's one and the same. And then in verse 11, he talks about what happens or what is the state of those who abandon or scorn or despise or reject wisdom. 
They Sorry, were... Abona. Hmm. There is part in verse 10. What the meaning have retreated from the Lord? Withdrawn. They pulled back. Oh, okay. They they neglected, they abandoned. They pre they looked the other way. They pretended they don't see what's happening. Thank you. Sure. Um so we're talking about henna yani the, the, those who abandon or scorn wisdom those who reject wisdom they will be really very miserable and very wretched and nothing works for them this is verse 11 <clears throat> it says yes and reassuring wretched are they who scorn wisdom and discipline their hope is void remember the contrast with the immortal hope their hope is void, their toil unavailing, their achievements unprofitable. Remember how, uh, so we talked uh, earlier about the hope that is eternal or immortal. So then we need to hope in someone or something that is immortal. And not only them, not only them, but also theirs, them and theirs those who are in their circles of influence, those who are under the authority. As verse 12, it says, a, their wives are reckless, their children depraved, their descendants accursed. This is like the, the complete opposite of um, Psalm 27. I think we mentioned that last week. Um, or maybe earlier today, I don't remember. You know, blessed is the one who fears the Lord. It talks about how their spouse will be blessed and their children will be like young olive branches or shoots around their table. Um, so their children will be blessed and their life and their labor will be blessed. You get to eat the fruit of your labor and like you get to reap the reward of your labor. You know, you get to see the results, etc. So how I live before the Lord, especially in the hidden place of my mind and heart, no, like in front of people, whatever. How I live before the Lord directly affects my hope, my labor, and my achievements, and directly affects my spouse, my children, and my descendants. So if if let's say this this can be a wonderful thing. And if 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 let's say you don't see the results of your labor in in you know, achievements or or your work or whatever. But uh, your spouse and your children are well and things are fine, then okay, then 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 I'm not godless. Then I'm not, uh, of course, with the guidance of your father confession, don't just come out to that conclusion on your own. You see what I'm saying? Like there's the, those who, who are godless, and by the way, now you may go, wait a minute, There's there are godless people that I know who are living it. Like, they have everything. They have, like, um, they're, they're, they are happy. Um, they have tons of fruit. They have lots of results from their work. Okay, but what is, so is the Bible lying? No, but what the Bible is saying is that even though they may have a ton visibly to other people no they they are as empty as if they don't have anything and the opposite is true those who are righteous who may seem like they don't have anything uh they're not getting the results of the labor or whatever no they're actually very rich and they just need to pay attention and see how rich they are um this reminds me of First Timothy five six. It's actually a very uh, interesting verse. You can pay attention to it before it says that she who is pampered or lives in indulgence is dead even while she lives. It's talking about like you know widows, uh, but but it's very interesting. Like the, the she, you can say the human soul or the person, the one who strives after being pampered and avoids pain at all cost and runs away from the fairness of God is dead 
even while they left. Um, okay, so that's that's we're done. Like we read through through um, uh, verse twelve, the first I guess big segment of chapter three. Now there's verses thirteen through nineteen from chapter three. We have uh, some time, I think, maybe. Yeah, I think we can finish it. Um, let's see if we can finish all of chapter three. So if, if does anybody have any questions or comments or anything first? Yeah, I wanna, yes. When you were talking when you were talking about the chosen, mm -hmm. uh the verse from uh Saint John uh uh chapter one it says to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Is that means chosen? Uh, yes. Yes. Those who believe oh, him, okay. those who received him. So they chose him, so he chose them. Yes. Or like we said earlier, that uh, because they chose him, he chose them to remain in the banquet. Because one day we all get to stand before God. And like by definition, heaven is where God is. So if I'm standing before God on judgment day, technically it is heaven. <laughs> um, but at that moment, I can be even though we are all called at that moment, I can be um, chosen to stay, to remain, or I can be unchosen or like rejected or kicked out. What is the proper garment to wear for the wedding? It's actually the garment of baptism. It is what we... Um, receive when we are baptized because it says like we we take off put off the old man and put in the new and superior one we actually put on christ um and you go so does that mean everybody who's baptized will be saved no because as we sin we blemish we we mar that garment that we were given and the way to make it nice and fresh and crisp and clean again, uh, fitting of being in the wedding banquet is through the sacrament of repentance and confession, where we get our sins washed away again and removed from us and put on to Jesus and, and being paid for by Jesus. That's why the church fathers call the sacrament of repentance and confession the new baptism, because you only get baptized once. I hope this uh, answers the question. Um, yes, thank you. Sure. And 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 it is a, a kind of scary reminder that just because one is baptized, does that is not a guarantee to heaven. It's somebody who is baptized and put on the garment that was freely given to them by the master. Um, because actually in that parable it says, like he, he you know he gave them the garments to put on for the wedding. Um think but those who did not keep it on by the time of the wedding bank banquet those who did not uh, protect it or keep it unblemished of course through the sacrament of repentance and confession um all right so let's see if uh, well 825. You know what? I'll I'll stop here, y'all. We can do verses thirteen through nineteen um, next week, and uh, I don't want to I don't want to rush through it or cut it short. Um, sorry. So we'll just call it. We did it from verse one through twelve. Does anybody have any uh, questions or comments, or as we usually do, something maybe that you're gonna try to remember or something that you you 
liked or will will try to live by that stood out to you from what we covered again god here is um, correcting the erroneous understanding of the world and the ungodly about how you know life is but a vapor so let's just take advantage of everything and let's just oppress everybody and do whatever etc cetera, etc cetera. and um uh you know let's let's live that kind of a life and do whatever we want to do to have fun even if it means stepping on the necks of the righteous and the uh and the godly and god is correcting all that understanding here in chapter three he said no 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 the souls of the virtues are in the hands of God. Torment shall never touch them. And then he clarifies all this. And then he goes, but the ungodly or the godless, etc., etc. That's what we'll cover um, next time. So do we have to confess our sins, sinful thoughts uh, to Abuna too? Yes. Not just our actions or deeds or words, but... I would say more importantly, our thoughts and our feelings, because that's the source. That's the spring that that the stuff comes out of. Our, like our Lord said, um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Um, but I do want to correct something in the question and the terminology. When you confess, you do not confess to Abuna. You are confessing to God, but in the presence of Abuna. Abunas is merely a witness who's been given the function of of putting the 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 cross on your head and praying the uh, prayer of absolution, asking God to remove the sin uh, from you and to pay for it on the cross. Just like um, who, who who's the one who changes the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ? Abuna. No, Christ himself. God does. Christ himself. When you take communion, you are taking it from the hand of Christ himself. But how Abuna is just the person who has been given the uh, permission to, to dare to stand there at the altar before God and to ask him to change the bread and the wine to the body and blood of Christ. Um, I hope this answered the question. But I want me... to say something, Abuna. Uh, 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 stop. Uh, Maximus had his hand up and then uh, mom. Yeah, I would just say I really love the verse number 10 which is God bought his children or his brethren before him um, said neglecting the virtuous man first and then uh, deserting the Lord. It's, it's it's a great lesson for piloting. Yeah, and, and sorry, go ahead. I'm just uh, let's say, um, it's it give me like a uh, hat in my in, in my in my face now that what did I do for the gender? And stuff? actually, he he did he did not. Put them before him. He made them him. Mm. What you do to them, you're doing to me. What you did not do to them, you did not do it to me. When you are neglecting them, you are neglecting the Lord or deserting the Lord. I want to say something, Abuna, about this chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, it is really so beautiful, this comparison between the godly and the ungodly. And we may know most of them, but unfortunately, why sometimes we are blind? Oh, yeah, our thinking changes soon. I don't understand. We're people. And we're, we're dumb sheep. We're forgetful. So They're so easy, and they are not difficult. If we ask God to help us to go in his way, he will not leave us. I'm sure of that. Actually, one thing I, I, if you go back and read um, what the Lord says to the uh, angels of the seven churches, um, yes. he, he often tells them, remember, remember, remember. Um, because while we believe and while we acknowledge that it is God, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we tend to forget a lot and we tend to forget very easily. Um, 
God wants us to remember. That's why it's important to have a journal of milestones. That's why it's important to um like even remember my own sins before confession and and to like to keep track of them and write them down. That's why it's important to uh remember God's word. That's why we should need to read it and stuff so that the Holy Spirit can remind us of the things that our Lord told us. Um the metaphor of the reflection of the silver of oh, beautiful and good reminder for this moment. Yeah. Ah, having said that, it is fire is painful. It hurts. But you know, we, we kind of do similar things with doctors, dentists, you know, um surgeons. Uh, we we let them, not we let them. We go to them so that they would do painful things to us. <laughs> um, but it's, we trust that it is for our good because we trust them. See, Yanni, we ought to do that much more with God, Yanni. And, and we do to a certain extent when I go and expose myself in confession, when I serve, when I give sacrificially, when I forgive those who hurt me unjustly. This is all I'm choosing I'm choosing the pain. I'm choosing actually a little fire for myself because I trust him. Because he said, do that. This is good for you. This will make you more pure. This will purge in you certain impurities. Um, the hard part is that when we don't choose it and we're minding our own business, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves in the furnace. Also, when I don't forget, Yanni, when we are in the middle of fire, he's with us, like the three years, right? Hopefully. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you all so much. Let's go ahead and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The Heavenly Father, God, um. Lord, I'm not going to even ask you to forgive us when we say ouch because you understand. You are very familiar with pain. As it says in the Bible, you are you are one who experienced pain and suffering. And Lord, we ask you that you chose to go through that before us so that you can show us how to handle it so that you can at least give us the message that you know what it feels like. Lord, you hungered, you thirsted, you wept. Um, you even felt alone and abandoned in Gethsemane when you asked your best friends to keep vigil and, and keep watch and stay with you and just pray for just one hour, but they even couldn't, even though they had the intention to do so. Lord, you've experienced all kinds of fire, um, way more than any of us can even endure or imagine. Lord, we thank you for your word. Help us a lot to remember that we are in your hand if we remain godly and righteous and virtuous. That um, we need to trust you and to rest, to be still and know that you are God. Help us a lot to remember these words when it's our turn to go through the fire and help us to be they are for our brethren when we are going through a cooling period and they are going through the fire. Lord, we thank you for your fire, even though it hurts. Help us to endure it, O oh Lord, so that we can hang in there until the end and receive that great good reward of being with you. We ask that please hear us through the intercession that may and all you since among us, so please, from the beginning through the mighty power of your love given cross, Please, O Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, I will be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the love of God, the Father, grace is only begotten Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, the communion, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. Well, shall next uh, Wednesday, God willing, we'll get into uh, finishing chapter three and getting into chapter four. God bless. Bye, y'all. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.